Department to pray without ceasing and to pray over all things. And Lord, we do pray for this service, the word that we teach from what Brother Branham taught, Lord, knowing that we, that he was vindicated of you, that you spoke to him and he spoke to you. And the answer always came back in that perfection which only could come back under anointed prophet like Moses or Paul. We appreciate that today. And we just ask you, Lord, to solemnize our hearts as never before to receive what has been spoken to us and been proven to be true where so much and so many years of messages and sermons have not been proven to be true but rather in the light of the hour have been proven to be way way far removed from the reality of your word even as when the time jesus himself came upon earth and the revelation of truth was so far removed from what they thought and stood for that they crucified the Lord of glory. And we know at the end time, people will do the same thing, crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. We recognize that, Lord, and we thank you that you help us that we will not be found in that number. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now we're on number 13 of the restoration. The bride tree is brought by Brother Branham. And we're going to catch up from last night to go on today now. Last night we saw Brother Branham trace the restoration of the bride tree, or, which is the bride of Christ, or also it's called the true church, the church of the living God, the body of Christ, there are various appellations. And so Brother Branham traced it through the reformation of the three steps of Luther, Wesley, and Pentecostals which three brought justification, sanctification, the baptism with the Holy Ghost, the restoration of gifts, of course, which when completed at the last days of Pentecostalism brings us to restoration. A restoration, according to Acts 2, Acts 3, is just exactly prior to the literal descent of the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, meeting the bride at the wedding supper. <clears throat> now, what Brother Branham is teaching here of the three steps of justification, sanctification, baptism with the Holy Ghost, leading us to this restoration can easily be understood from the book of Acts chapter 2 and 38 to 39 where it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now you take that instantly to the first chapter of Ephesians and you'll find out what the baptism with the Holy Ghost leads you to. And it says, in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed you received with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance of the, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> so you see right here that the baptism with the Holy Ghost actually leads you right to the resurrection. And before the resurrection, there is a restoration. So we say then that it's easily understood these three steps preceding restoration because once you have repented and been justified by grace and baptized in water, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you are face to face with the resurrection and the kingdom of God on earth. Now listen, the resurrection brings you physically into the presence of God who himself becomes physical to us. That's right. So once you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, the next step, even though there are years in between, that makes no difference. You are told right here you have the earnest of the resurrection. And in that resurrection, you will be physical and you will meet God physically once more, the same as he was met on earth. Now this, there, now there is a great gap, there is a, rather there is a gap at the end time where the last few members of the bride tree or the body of Jesus Christ, the true church, the church of God, call it what you want, do not die and face the resurrection and then God in flesh, but must come to a place of restoration, which point is where Adam was with God, who was in spirit form, God was, he wasn't in the form of a man, and Adam was physical, and where Adam could get to the tree of life and immortality, but he was stopped. 
Now, what you've got to come to that place because you're dealing with Adam as a living person, going to the tree of life for immortality. The cherubim, because of God, says, no, you cannot do that. Lest you live in that condition you are in eternally, and you cannot do it. So there was a great interruption. Now, what I'm trying to show you, Alpha is Omega, and you cannot deny that reality. He had to get to that tree of life. We know Christ is that tree of life. <clears throat> God himself is the only living God. And Adam was cut off from getting there. The cherubim would not allow him to go. So, all right, we are now at the place where that is restored. There are going to be some few living people, not many, maybe 500, 1,000 or something, I don't know, but it's going to be like the days of Noah. Very few are going to be standing here in their own human bodies right restored to that place where they can now come into immortality now listen what happened to adam and eve they went off the word the obedience of faith off the word was gone had they stayed there they could have stayed there thousands and thousands of years so we must get back to that there has to be a restoration now you can see this is logical from scripture it's not only thus saith the Lord by a prophet who was vindicated like Moses and Paul, which he was, and anybody to deny that will have to destroy history. He'd have to kill me too because they're not going to get away with it. There has to come that restoration back to that word, see, <clears throat> to come into immortality. Now, this simply cannot under any circumstances come to pass until the bride tree, or what do you want? We're referring it to the tree because Paul said, You are God's husbandry, you're God's agriculture, you're God's plot, plot of ground, and He's growing out of you what He has planted, sown, and seeded in you. <clears throat> so, this simply cannot, under any circumstances, come to pass until the tree, bride tree, puts out its last branch. Now, there's the Word of God speaks of, and you. And I'll come back to my notes and I'll read it for you again. But you want to get it right here in the book of Romans, <clears throat> the 14th chapter, uh, 11th chapter. Now it says in verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be comes in. That's, that's the church. The Gentile age is all over. Now, it's not the times of the Gentiles. That's political and geographical. This is 100% spiritual and apart from politics and geography. This is a mystery. <clears throat> now, the last, what is Arrhenius said, Christ cannot come until the last member, elected member to the body of Christ comes in. And Brother Branham added correctly, child trained. You can't because it's in the adoption. And the adoption goes right into the resurrection. Now, if we're in that hour, these things have got to simply got to happen. <clears throat> so, when you're going to call the bride of Christ a tree, you have to realize that there's going to come a time when the last branch is going to come upon it. They're not going to be anymore. That's why you get the picture of the vine. The branches that are dead the churches that have left the life of Christ and Christ has gone on because they haven't gone on with the light. They're pruned and they're taking away. It's the same thing that says the wheat is separated from the chaff and the chaff is burned and the boughs are burned. It's all the same thing, but said in so many ways that it will strike the people that are in that particular category that are interested in buildings or agriculture, grazing of sheep, growing grapes, you name it making wine. It doesn't matter. You'll find that same thing in there. Now, <clears throat> it tells you then that the life of Christ in the baptism with the Holy Ghost has to run out at a certain time. And it's when it runs out. And it tells you right here in Ephesians, at that time, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation and the knowledge of him. The church receives the fullness of the spirit of Almighty God and see where it takes us. It takes us 
to the mighty working of the power of God in verse 19, which raised him from the dead. It puts you right into the resurrection. It tells you there's a gap in here. When the baptism with the Holy Ghost runs out, it means the last elected member has been baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what I told you happened in the book of Acts, which is the third chapter. <clears throat> and in the third chapter, it, it, we're, we're looking at where Peter's preaching. And he said to the Jews, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Then he says, when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And that absolutely is a revival sent from God. And it's a healing revival. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was appointed unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets of the world began. He tells you right there that there is going to be a great, there's going to be this last day revival. There, there's, and which Brother Branham truly indicated and showed us was a healing revival. And with it will come a message of the word re-given. The same message that Paul brought is going to be absolutely verified as to its correct revelation. It has to be. That's 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, verses 7 to 10. You can't deny the Bible. There's a gap in here. And that gap is where there is restoration and the presence of God himself is there to bring it. And you cannot deny it. There's no way for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven <clears throat> with a shout. And that word shout is the same word, klusma, it's the same word in 1 Corinthians 15 that puts you under command. God himself comes down and puts his church under his own authority, away from denomination, priests and popes and presidents and everything else. Well, see, I don't believe that. You don't have to believe anything. But just show me one reason why you don't believe it. Pit it against a man who was vindicated. Listen, I was in these meetings dozens of times. Never one time did thus saith the Lord ever fail. Never one time. Show me anybody that's got that record. Show me a man vindicated. Went back to the word every single time. I'm going on 80 years of age. I've lived 79 already. And I will know where I speak. I've read the books. I know the history. I've forgotten more, perhaps, than some of you folk will ever know along this line. That's not just boasting. I read many, many books on theology now. Great men of God, not that they were wrong. They were right for their day. But at the end time, there has to come this restoration of the word. Billy Graham sat on the airplane with, <clears throat> with uh, Ned Iverson. Ned Iverson's dad, Dr. Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Iverson, wrote, Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me, which brought a revival. He struck up a conversation, Billy Graham, which, which doesn't mean anything. Who's Billy Graham? He doesn't mean a thing to me, except as a fine Christian brother. That's good. But what's worse? He's authority. But he admitted the word had not been restored. See, so what's he going to do about it? Nothing. He's not, he's not required to do a thing about it. He's doing his own thing. He's doing his own job. He's doing a good job. Billy Graham's a fine man of God, well-respected and well-loved. <clears throat> speaks out on issues that are very, very pertinent. See? And that's very good. So, all right. <clears throat> the bride tree. All right. Genesis, going back again. <clears throat> Adam is standing there. <clears throat> now look, when Adam is standing there, God is not in a physical form. He's in a spirit form. And he comes down in the form of that spirit. It could be a pillar of fire. It could be a cloud. It could be a rustling in the weed. When I don't know. But I do know God was not manifest in flesh. That did not take place until the time of Jesus Christ, though God himself didn't manifest himself in the flesh of Melchizedek. And that's not something that God can do. God can do anything he wants to do. <clears throat> but God literally manifested in human flesh was not in the Garden of Eden, it was way back there. So, all right. Then the requirements of Alpha and Omega, the, the beginning, what was sown, must come to pass at the very end the way it was. The interruption brings it up here. So what have you got? You've got Adam and God on earth. Now, we're talking about mankind, the ones that are bride that are going to go to that tree and live forever. God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, must be here now. And that's what Ephesians said. And that's what it says here in the book of Acts. Now, that's not hard to understand. That's simple as ABC. Once you let your thinking go and begin to believe what you're taught by a vindicated man. <clears throat> All right. 
Now, this last growth, this last limb coming out, is the top. That's the very top of the tree, right? Now watch carefully. The actual top of any tree, unless you lop it off, you understand? The actual top of any tree is that original first shoot that came out of the root. And it keeps moving up and moving up and moving up. Naturally, it would. I've got trees in my yard, and they're, they're, they're uh, the uh, <coughs> blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce, and you better believe that there has not been one limb lopped off of those trees. And we have, we have different ones in the yard. And every one that was that little shoot is now that top. Now, one day there's going to be a time when that tree will not grow one more inch. It's over. And either live forever is going to die. Something's got to happen. Now, that's where we find the church today. Remember in Daniel's vision, it was from the head down, the head of gold, down to feet. Now it's from feet up to the head. And this is what you find in the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> how God sent the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit ministry in order to build an edifice which went right up unto Christ, to a capstone. Now remember, the cornerstone was put at naught. And the cornerstone becomes the capstone. Because Christ is the cornerstone and Christ is the capstone. And you take that cornerstone, it'll fit right on top of the pyramid. So therefore, again, the principle Alpha and Omega is correct. I am Alpha and Omega. You cannot tell that God anything. You say, Lord, I don't believe you're Alpha and Omega. That doesn't do one bit of good. He, he is Alpha and Omega. Amen. Yeah. Always was and never can, never can change at any, any time whatsoever. <clears throat> so all right, the actual top of any tree should be, and in this case is, the original shoot out of the ground. The original one of whom Paul spoke and said, the foundation for the building I have laid is Jesus Christ the righteous. But the bride is also called husbandry, not just a building. And Brother Branham at the end of time called it a tree. So the church should have been one glorious display of God's fruit, which was Christ. Because he was God's fruit. The tree planted by the water that brought forth his fruit is God's fruit. And he brought forth the word, complete word of God in Christ. And God completely manifested himself as to who he and what he was in and through Jesus. So Jesus could say, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus was not the Father. And Jesus was not God. He was the Son of God. People can't get God hit straight. I don't understand it. I'm not going to fuss about it. I just give up. I give up. They say, brother, they say, Lee Vale is teaching two gods. Well, I believe Brother Branham. You know that. I believe him implicitly. And if I'm teaching two gods, then listen to William Branham teaching two gods, a man we claim is vindicated. A man we claim that's the actual picture of the pillar of fire, scientific. I don't care to anybody, but we believe it. And we can show you their records. There's even a couple of films extant. Oh, my God, I wish there'd been hundreds of films, but that wasn't God's doing. Now, listen, <clears throat> Brother Brianna speaks of the original creation back there. And he, he says, what's, what's he doing? God's writing his first Bible. Notice the human beings once looked toward the heavens, and he put all the stars in the heavens, the zodiac, starting off with the virgin, ending up with Leo the lion. First coming, Christ the second coming, came by the virgin, comes again as the lion, the tribe of Judah. He, there he puts his Bible. Everyone knows the 12 signs of the zodiac of Bibles and stars, the same as the pyramid as the Bible and rock. And you can read Bullinger and Sice and various other authors, and they will show you absolute biblical truths that are of no end. It's marvelous there. <clears throat> oh, back in the days of ancient days, they looked at those things. Today, he's got his Bible written here, but he wrote it in the heavens. That's the first. Then man could look up and realize Jehovah, the creator, was above. And then I can see him. He looked at that. I can see the end. I can see the seed of this world hanging there as an icicle, whatever it was anyway. And it moved way over there. I can see this little light go out. Now we've got two. The Father, and out of the Father came the light, the Son. Now, God the Son isn't true. It's the Son of God. God is one being. He's Holy Spirit. And when there wasn't a speck of stardust, there wasn't one atom, there was nothing, a light form. What could it form out of except God? What does a baby form out of except the woman? 
You know, so easy to think if you let your thinking go, you can become so foolish with dogma. And creedal misunderstanding destroys the end for every insight. Now, Brother Branham says right here, and I concur 100% because that's exactly what Paul said in the first chapter of Hebrews. Anybody can read it. It's there. Two. One is God who becomes a father, and there's the sin. Do what you want about it. <clears throat> no problem with me. See? Now, so the church should have been one glorious display of God's fruit, which was Christ. But no, the organization of creeds and dogmas ate it off. God's fruit, the word, was put aside and finally outside the church. That's Revelation 3. So the church grew without this fruit. And the bugs ate up all manifestation that belongs to the fruit tree. And only bare life of God kept on past the dead branches which God pruned away. Now finally the bride is about complete. It is time to return to the tree of life and immortality. So the cornerstone, the first shoot of the tree, is now the capstone. And we see God's promise, I will restore, made manifest in the person of God himself, bringing forth the same fruits according to Matthew 12 as it was in Jesus on earth. Now, I'll read this again. I read it hundreds of times to you. <clears throat> but let's look at Matthew, the 12th chapter. And let's begin to understand some things here that have been glossed over for perhaps hundreds and maybe no doubt hundreds of years. Now it says in chapter, verse 15 of 12, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. And he charged them they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Now listen, behold my servant in whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He didn't even go near the Gentiles. The closest he got was to a Samaritan woman. So all right. This can't be to the Jews. There's something in here indicative and predictive concerning him from Isaiah that it has to do with the Gentiles. Let's read further. He shall not strive. Hogwash, he strove. Is that a fact? Come on, is that a fact? Let's understand it. He strove. He went to the temple and he braided out of ropes, whips, and he whipped the daylights out of them. He strove. So this is a lie. Oh, well, I just don't see it, Brother Bale. Well, oh, come on, open your eyes. It's in here, he's got to do it. He didn't strive, he, he strove, nor cry. John 7, 37, 39, he raised his voice in the streets at the last feast. He said, no man shall hear his voice in the streets. He was a street preacher. The bruised reed he shall not break, he broke it. The smoking flax he'll not quench. He quenched it. This is not to the Jews. He says the Gentile church started on that solid rock, will endure to the end, and God will come forth and in judgment give her victory. Right to the tree of life. How anybody can doubt that's more than I know. At the end time, Christ is now revealed in his own word and proven by vindication. I'm quoting from William Branham, a vindicated man. <clears throat> until people, until he went off the scene and people began to hate him and fuss about everything he said, they admitted his ministry was an act, was a duplication of the ministry of Jesus Christ. It wasn't his ministry anymore, it was Jesus' ministry. Jesus said, the miracles that are doing, the, the things that I'm doing, I'm not doing them. What I'm telling you, I'm, it's not my words. You know your Bibles, that's what he said. And let's go a little further. Jesus wasn't God, he was a prophet and a son of God. Yeah. And as the psalmist said, he called them gods to whom the word of God comes. And who does the word of God come to but a prophet? <clears throat> I came through an age of dithering. 
reading everybody under high heaven, but no man was vindicated till this man. When I saw everybody in a prayer line of about maybe a thousand, everyone was healed. There wasn't one deaf that didn't hear, one dumb that didn't speak, one blind eye that didn't open and see, and one crippled back and twisted legs that wasn't made straight. Healed them all. I saw it. I'm a Gentile. And I knew if I ever listened to any man, I'd listen to that man I've listened. And if he's condemned, I'm condemned with him. If he's going to the lake of fire, I'm happy to go to the lake of fire. Because I'll tell you why. Where I will be going to the lake of fire will be a million times better than those who think they know something and they merely prate the words of some man and there's no vindicated. Nothing vindicated. All right, let's read. The tree grows <clears throat> from one place or one level to another, from one dispensation to another. From Luther it went to Wesley, from Wesley to Pentecost, Pentecost it goes to the Word. Now, why does he say that? It tells you right in that fourth church age, if the Catholic Church, who has Jezebel, a prophetess, she's a harlot and the mother of harlots, if she does not repent, which means to change her mind concerning God and her understanding, she and her daughters go to the tribulation and the lake of fire. But out of that comes the light of Luther, justification. But the Catholic Church wouldn't listen. Where is it today? Look at it. Look at their fruit, homosexual priests. Why? Because they denied him the natural function of man. They went ahead of the Word of God. Jesus himself said, celibacy is not for all men. And why does the Catholic Church say, I can ordain every priest and he'll be celibate? Hogwash. Oh, come on. I'm not, Amen. I'm not going, you know, chucking this for the Protestants. I'm no longer a Protestant. I'm just a Christian. The Protestants have no more protest than, a, you know, than a, the weight of a cigarette paper. And I think they're out of style, too. From Luther went to Wesley, Wesley to Pentecost. Pentecost, it goes to the Word. It's the only place it can go. You know, the place it can go. Because the Lord himself descends with that shout, that klusma, <clears throat> which is distinctly a message to the church where the church becomes subject to him. Because the word klusma means subjection. And it's not coercion. No. So we're back where Adam was. Now we're back to a degree, led by the Word the way Adam was. It's Easter again for the true believers of his never-failing Word. Hundreds of thousands of Christians say the same thing. They don't say it the way we say it. They know there's something stirring in the air. They know there's a truth. But they fail to realize Elijah must come to the Gentiles. Do you realize that when Jesus talked about his resurrection, he positively identified himself with a prophet that went to the Gentiles? Jonah. And now you've got an anti, another, you've got it being fulfilled in the last day, Alpha being, Alpha and Omega is the same. <clears throat> you have a prophet to the Gentiles. It's Easter, it's resurrection. God's got people everywhere. It's Easter for them. Why? They have risen. Amen. Risen from their creeds and denominations. Come right up through them. It's Easter again, or it's resurrection time. The royal seed has been hid in the roots, the word, back here in this word for years and years and years, actually almost 2,000, and just now begin to be revealed. It's Easter time, predestinated from the foundation of the world, this church is beginning to stand. Now, already you know that's Matthew 12. We read it a while ago. <clears throat> and already you know it's over here again in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, 11th chapter, I beg your pardon. We've, we've read this hundreds of times. 
I make no apology for reading of it a hundred times more if it's necessary. And Paul said, I, he said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Verse 2, I've espoused you to one husband. I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now listen, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, and they did, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which they did, which you have not received, or another gospel, and they did it, three strikes and you're out. Isn't there a show called Three Strikes and You're Out now? I think I read that. Everything shows what's going on in the world. You can't find even one slang, catchy phrase anymore. That doesn't indicate us all wrapped up and all over. Listen, how far off can you get with another Jesus, another spirit, and another word? Tell me. And if it started 2,000 years ago, where is it today? People say, well, bless God, I can read that. They read it back there, and they read it better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they read it better, and they knew more. And even back in the first age, they had a split church over a diphthong, which means two vowels in the Greek with a different sound. Oh, yeah. Because the Greek isn't punctuated. It goes by rhythm. And the kids in school are taught to accent the words, and that's how you punctuate. There's no upper and lower case. Oh, hallelujah, we're different. 2,000 years later from the original? How many of you this morning drove to this church here in a 1927 Ford? Raise your hands. No. You're not being interested in relics and antiques. You want a car that moves. I'd like to trade my car in, too, for one that moves a little better, too. I'm happy to trade my religion in for something that God vindicates. Amen. And God is behind. Oh, yes. When you hear a man say, thus saith the Lord, your husband is in the hospital in New York. He's a veteran. They don't know a thing wrong with him, but thus saith the Lord, tomorrow he'll be sitting in this chair healed, and he was right there the next day sitting in the chair healed. How did he know who did it? Come on. I saw that time after time. Yeah. I'm not talking about the healing now. I'm talking about thus saith the Lord. No man can come in the name of the Lord and God back him and him not be God's prophet just like Moses. Come on, read your Bibles. Read your Bibles, I challenge you. Get with the Word of God. I feel real good now. If I was back in Pentecost, I'd be screaming and running right now. I'll be honest to God with you. I'm not lying. I couldn't contain myself. I'd be crying and screaming. Reality strikes. It's not merely an emotion that someone sits with his Bible and gets himself so full with his own thinking that something explodes within him. That will never bring thus saith the Lord and see the power of miracles and of indication that God gave Moses and God gave Paul. Nobody can doubt Paul was vindicated. William Branham was vindicated. Amen. The royal seed's been hit in the roots. That's what happened. Joel tells you. The word hit back here in this word for years and years and years begun to be, begin to be revealed. It's Easter time predestinated from the foundation of the world. This church is beginning to stand. Notice how God predestinated in the beginning. I'm going to say it anyhow. Now, why does he say I'm going to say it anyhow? Because the Pentecostals hated the word predestinated. They can't stand it. Everything is free will, free will, free will. I can come to God. I can backslide. I can go to hell. I can come back to God. Oh, hallelujah. Escape from hell. Oh, I backslid back to hell. Oh, forget it. When did God ever have yo-yo Christians? Come on. They hated the word predestination, so he said, well, I'll use the word foreknowledge, and they grinned. Well, you know, you hate the word cancer. So they go to the doctor, and the doctor knows you hate the word cancer, and he said, well, you have a little polyp. <laughs> Wonderful. Huh? Predestination is the word. It means there was a foreknown destiny, and that thing is right there the way God said it. God knew. Under that seat, I usually sit in. 
There'd be for years a great big thick concordance and a notebook and some pencils in a box in case I lose, leave my pens at home. And colored pens to underline what suddenly comes to my mind. He knew it. He didn't just know it because I put it there. He knew I was going to put it there. He knew Pharaoh was going to kill those children. But you know why he could judge Pharaoh? Pharaoh didn't have to do it. God knew he's going to do it. It was ordained. All right, he says here, notice here, to restore the perfect, perfect tree in three days after his death. Now, he's talking about Jesus, the perfect tree of God, the perfect fruit of God, the perfect manifestation of God, because that's exactly true. Because he said, what you see me do, it's my Father in me. What you're hearing me say, it's my Father talking in me. What more could you want? You know, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? What a marvelous man Jesus was. After the first tree death, he restored it in three days. Now, we're going back to Alpha to Omega to this day, and we're hitting the type. We're hitting like in this, in Jesus has now become type, and we're getting anti-type on this particular thought. Now, just don't be confused by my words. I've tried to choose them very carefully. This is really in a type. After the first tree, that's Jesus' death, God restored it in three days. Is that right? Restored it back. And who was he? He was the Word, right? Now, the bride tree is also going to be restored in three stages. Three stages, it'll be restored. Now, look, what? Justification, sanctification, baptism with the Holy Ghost, one, two, three. Now, notice, after three days, the first tree restored as at the beginning, having the same signs, same wonders. Jesus came back, the same Jesus doing the same things. How do you know he did? In the resurrection, he was on the seashore there, and he had loaves and fishes. He just, he just created them. And his resurrection sat down and ate a fish sandwich with his boys, with his friends. So, well, I don't think I like that thought of that kind of a millennium, with that kind of resurrection. Who asked you to think anything? Right. If I invite you to my supper table, do I send you an invitation and say, I'll cook a special meal for you? I've already cooked a special meal for you. Come and take it. Simple as ABC. <coughs> After three days. <clears throat> At the end of the third day, the, the signs appeared. Not at the end of the first day. Notice even on the road to Emmaus, what happened? Oh, brother, I hope you, you're getting it. At the, third, at the third day is when the real manifestation of Christ was made known at the end of the third day. Now, what's he talking about? Jesus was absolutely the Son of God, or God would not have raised him. And there he was. The Bible says in a different form. And they recognized him not by what he looked like, but what he was doing. Amen. For they saw the man on the shore, and he said, have you caught any fish? Do you have any meat? They said, no, we've toiled all night. He said, throw the, the, the net on the other side. The minute they threw it, listen, how wide is a boat, as Dr. Price once said? This, hey, this pulpit could be the boat they're fishing in. How wide? How wide from here where there's no fish to here, where there's multitudes of fish? They pulled in the net, it was almost breaking, and Peter said, that's Jesus! By what he did. Yeah. God in the man. God doing it. If he did it, he had to do it all the time. Now at the first day, dead form. Second day, still dead Luther, Wesley. In the beginning of the third day, there was a rumor around. And you know that rumor was? Of course, it's Pentecost, a rumor. Let's keep reading. Nothing on the first day, Luther. Nothing on the second day. And in the third day, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, there was a rumor around that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. <clears throat> that came out of Pentecost with their gifts of healing. <clears throat> Not real gifts of healing, just healing. I don't believe they had gift of healing back there. From what I saw in Brother Branham and Dr. Price and various men of that caliber, it was my understanding Brother Branham alone had a true gift of healing. I saw things that stood before Dr. Price and stood and stood and stood. But when the gift of healing went into operation and I saw it in Lima High and I saw it elsewhere, nothing stood. Every miracle, bang, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifty miracles in fifty minutes. <clears throat> I never saw that in any other person. 
and, I'm a, and I am a person of the 20th century. You have your Wigglesworths and your Roberts and you have your uh, Prices and you, well, let's not worry about Sister McPherson because she's a kind of a no-no in my books. You, you know, women preachers, I, I just leave them alone and pray they'll leave me alone. <clears throat> now listen, let me tell you something here. Hebrews 13 and 8, according to fundamental people, is always the acts and the manifestation coming into order that shows them he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Brother Branham did not say that. Vindicated prophet now, let's get this. He said it was chapter 18 of the book of Genesis where God, in a human form, which he was, with two angels, also in human form, stood outside the tent, and Sarah in the tent, and God stood at Abraham just before the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he, with his back to the tent, said, Sarah is going to have a child by you. This is the time. And Sarah said, ha, ha, ha. Shall I and my Lord have pleasure, physical pleasure of sex again? We've had it for years and years. Will we get it back? And that's the end of it. She no more believed for a baby than nothing. And God said, Sarah, why did you laugh? She said, oh, but I didn't laugh. She's laughing inside, you see, a little joke to herself. He said, oh, but you did laugh. And Brother Spano stood there before thousands. I saw him time after time turn his back to the thousands of people and say, there's a man out there. Call him by name. The man said, you, he said, your name is Mitchell. You're from West Virginia. You are a minor. You have lung disease, black lung. Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. In, 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 in Kansas, <clears throat> a black man sat in the audience. He was backslidden. Brother Branham looked down upon that man. He said, sir, he said, he said, you are a Christian, but he said, you're not living in victory. The man said, that's right. He said, you're also very, very sick. He said, that's right. He told him what it was. And he said, he said, you are healed. And he said, furthermore, you are forgiven. And a ripple went through the congregation. He said, I caught that. He said, you're saying, how can I, a man, say the man is forgiven? Let me tell you this. The same one that told me what his name was, what his disease was, and told him he was healed, is the same one that told me he's forgiven. Oh, we can be so self-righteous all of a sudden because we don't have the first fruit. We want to stick to some church. What's your church going to do? If it follows you to the end, it'll bury you nicely and say nice words, even though we're not, not even be worthy of them. I don't mean to smile and get a joke out of this, but the fact of the matter is I wonder if I didn't preach some people into heaven at their funeral. I wonder. I don't anymore. I steer away from the subject and tell them how you can get there. There was a rumor. The Pentecostals thought the restoration of gift was the restoration spoken of by, uh, by the prophet Joel and also by Malachi, and also by Jesus. It was a restoration of gifts, and the people that believe in Elijah ministry also teach the restoration and manifestation of gifts. And they said, that's restoration, but it's not. It's merely restoration of gifts. Why? Because you've got to get back to the Word, because without the Word, there aren't any gifts, period. Without the Word, there isn't a breath of fresh air. Without the Word, there isn't a speck of stardust. There's not a speck of dust. There, without the Word, there is not life. There is nothing without the Word. Amen. Because all things are made by the Word, and all things are maintained by the Word. This is our understanding. But at the end of the third day, that's at the end of Wesley, Luther, Pentecostal, <clears throat> that's when he made himself known came right down amongst them, came amongst his people and said, look at me, I am that same one. The dead forms went on until they got to Pentecost, then began a rumor around that he was. Now here in this last day, here he is right with us, moving right amongst us. And then people deny the very word in the Bible that says presence, he's here and nobody saw him come and nobody knew how he got here, but he's here. That's what the word presence Persia means. <clears throat> At the end of the third day, he appeared and showed all of them his resurrection sign that he was living. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Living fruits of his presence. Living fruit of his presence. Are you getting it? In other words, Brother Branham is telling the people, do you understand the same God that is working through me is that same one that wor was working through that man. That same living God that was present in human flesh is now present amongst the bride 
and manifesting himself through human flesh, which is a prophet. Listen, if Paul wasn't a prophet and an apostle that started it, there's got to be one that finishes it. It can't help it because Alpha is always Omega. The seed sown has to come back. Amen. What was sown in the first church to bring the first church? The apostle, prophet, Paul. It's got to come back to the very same, and it isn't going to be Paul come back from the dead. I hope you understand principles in the scripture. My brother, my sister, they are there. They, <clears throat> he appeared to them all, his church, why? <clears throat> they all got together, amen, at the end of the third day. The bride is coming together. The evening lights, the Bible said, would shine on the last day. The evening light is the same light in the west that was the same light that was in the east. Now, that's, how, how could we miss that? How could we miss it? There's only one sun. There's not three suns up there, four suns that, that have to do with our earth. There could be a million suns out there in the universe somewhere. Who cares? But the one that has to do with us, if it ceased to shine, we'd all be frozen by morning <laughs> within a few hours. If the sun went out, it's all gone, frozen stiff like an iceberg or whatever. <clears throat> the same light, it shall be light at evening time, and the light come. What other light can it be? There can't be another light other than the original. Now remember, the original life was God manifested in Christ. Paul received the revelation. The same life of God manifested through Paul, vindicated Paul, showing that he had the right to the word. Who then is going to restore the word? It's going to have to be somebody that has the same testimony. And Paul said, I want to charge you, brethren, and know this. What I am preaching to you is not a man. I never learned it by myself. I never got it from myself. I never got it from seminary. I'm going to tell you flat, I was face to face with him in the desert. I am bringing you his word, and I am vindicated by the miracles and signs, and you know from Rome and Illyricum, all around it is known. The ministry I have that vindicates me goes right back to Moses. And Moses was vindicated. First of all, God vindicated himself to Moses. Moses, the, the burning bush is there. Moses could have said, well, you know that. I better, I better hightail it down the road. This is ridiculous. His curiosity was piqued. <clears throat> God knew just how to reach him. And he said, the bush is not burning. Marvelous. And he stood there. And a voice said, Moses, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. God vindicated himself to Moses. Then God vindicated Moses to the people. And Moses vindicated, had a vindicated word. This is the Bible, brother, sister. How do we get back to it? God's got to send a prophet and do what he always did. He can't change. The people said to God one day, so Moses, they said, Moses, Moses, we can't stand this earth shaking. We can't stand the fire. We can't stand the thunder. We know God is there. Moses. Please go up and tell God for us. Look, great God, deal with Moses. Then send back Moses to deal with us. God, Moses went up there, if you believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, it's just a cute little story. You know, kind of nice. Crazy, but you know. So Moses goes up and God said, it. fine. They've well spoken what they've spoken. I agree. Go back and tell them. I'll never deal with them again outside of a prophet. Therefore, as Brother Branham said, and I never read it any book anywhere, and I read my books. He said, you cannot worship and serve God outside of a prophet. Amen. There it is, prophet's word. I'm satisfied. <clears throat> What's going to restore the word today, a prophet? It wasn't Joe Smith. It wasn't Mary Baker Eddy. It wasn't the Council of Ministers. God's got to send a prophet. You say, what if the prophet comes and I miss him? Just a minute, how many people caught on to Jesus? How many people in Jerusalem stood there at the, at the, at the crucifixion and knew <clears throat> outside of a man like the centurion of Rome and a Gentile who said, this indeed is the Son of God? Everybody running and screaming and running off. When the seal was broken, the rock rolled away. How many believed? He was only seen above 500 people when he came out of the ground and walked amongst them about 40 days. 10 days, whatever it was, I forget now. A few days in there. How many are going to believe today? How many will believe today if it repeats? <clears throat> 
See, there it is. And at the end of the third day, he, sh he appeared and showed all them his resurrection sign. He was living the same yesterday, day, and forever, living fruit of his presence, living fruit of his presence. Are you getting it? For it manifested at the very end of the day when he appeared to all of them, his church. Why? They'd all come together, amen, at the end of the third day. The evening lights, the Bible said, would shine the last day. The same evening light, light in the west is the same one that shone in the east. It has to be in the same light that shone in the east that brought forth the first church that the Roman, the Romans cut down by their pagan worship and so forth. In the evening light is the same light. It's got to be. You can't have two or three gods. You can't have two or three Jesus. You can't have two or three spirits. You can't have two or three words. You've got to go back to what it was. God himself appeared to Paul. There's no two ways about it. Out there in the desert with Jehovah. Absolutely vindicated. Absolutely revealed Jesus the Christ to him. <clears throat> Showed him the whole truth of the resurrection. By revelation, he understood communion, the Lord's Supper, foot washing, all of those things. Just Nobody told him. God told him. Came back and established the church. Do you think anybody would listen to that man unless he was predestinated? Or do you think anyone would listen unless Paul had some kind of vindication? Now, I realize that the Mormons believe Joe Smith. I don't care what they believe. I've lived amongst them. I know what they got. I've lived amongst a lot of people. We were part Reformed and part Catholic out of our family. I've been in Pentecost with Baptists, the whole bunch. That's fine. I have no problem with those people. They have what they have. But I'm going to tell you one thing. At least those people stuck with the word the best they could, and they knew that there wouldn't be a prophet like Joe Smith going to do anything for them because the man merely came back and said, I saw, I say this, I say that. Buddha does the same thing. Confucius, the same thing. The Taoists are in the same group. The Muslims are in the same bunch. And you know the name Allah is not the name of God. It's the God of a devil. We don't stand with that. We claim we believe this Bible written by prophets. And if God sends a prophet, just like wrote this Bible, the people turn on him. Now, the question is this. If they do, do they not crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him in open shame? Amen. That's the question I'm looking at this morning, the question I can answer in my own heart. This is exactly what has been done and they're going to be doing. Now, Brother Branham <clears throat> goes on. He said it's the same light. And what's the evening light come up for? What is the evening light for? To restore you get it? The evening light is for the same purpose the morning light was for, to restore what was cut down by the dark ages through Rome. God is going to restore by shining forth in the evening light. Now, Brother Branham is giving an illustration here, which is literally a parable. And you can follow through by your history. What? Restore the whole word of God again, the full manifestation of Christ in his church. Everything that he did, just exactly the way he did, would be again in the evening light. See what I mean? Oh, isn't it wonderful? And to know we're living right here to see it. Now listen, Brother Branham is not saying, now listen, Bride Church, you are all going to raise the dead. He said, everybody does not pray for the sick. There isn't one of us that's a jack of all trades and a master of none, or that we are accomplished in every single thing in the ministry and out of the ministry. For instance, gifts of the Spirit should never be in the church on the floor. That's where the Word is preached. It's out there in a little room somewhere where they get together, where someone has a spirit of discernment to know what it's a God or of the devil, or that person has reality. And then it's all checked up before it even comes to the people. Amen. The church under divine order. <coughs> Brother Branham did not preach for one minute that everyone, <clears throat> the church as a whole, would have this. He said, if my hand does it, my body has done it. And if a prophet comes on the scene and brings forth those same manifestations that were in Christ because God is doing it, then the church has done it because that prophet, absolutely, the scripture said, the church is built upon the apostles and the prophets. So where do you get back? How do you get to understand there's a capstone the same as the cornerstone? How do you know it is the capstone if it doesn't repeat per perfectly what was in the cornerstone? I hope I'm not preaching over your heads. To me, it is so simple. Now, the evening light, exactly according to prophets, the evening light came to restore what? To restore what the bugs had eaten up. One, it started growing. And then what did it do? It denominated us so that God pruned it off, bound them up, laid them back, and let them go ahead and organize. Two, 
The next one came up, bound them, laid them off. The tree, he just has to cut the lop the branches off. <clears throat> now, on the last day, the organizations are going to be all bound together and burned. Now, that's exactly true. The tares must all come together. Now, let's look at the picture very closely. <clears throat> when you look at tares, you have many similitudes in the scripture that begin to tell you the truth. Jesus, they, Jesus gave a parable. He said, there's a certain man, a farmer. He sowed good seed. Everybody knew it. And then a few days later, here's a bunch of tares. Well, he said, an enemy did this. Now, in, jo in Matthew, he said, now beware of false shep uh, prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, inwardly ravening wolves. They've got all the trappings of a Christian. They've got all the love. They've got all the sweet talk. They've got all the nice deeds. They've got all the happy thinking. Everything is right there, but they're off the word. They're the same, they're tares. He said, on that day of judgment, they'll come to him, Lord, did we not cast out devils? Did we not do so and so? I never knew you. And those that go with him. I never knew you. Depart from me in everlasting fire. And what does he say about the tares? The tares, <coughs> he says, they are bound and they're burned. And what does he say about the chaff? And the chaff is the last thing that the wheat is in. It looks identical to wheat until the drying season comes on. Then the chaff pulls away and it's burned. Every time you see a burning, you have to understand it's the very same person or thing he's talking about. And you cannot talk of fire until the end time. Every time you see that word, you know it's got to be resurrection. You know there's got to be great tribulation. You know there's going to be millennium. Listen, there are things in the Bible that you simply cannot ignore. And just run and say, well, isn't this nice? Well, this says so-and-so. You've got a hodgepodge, or I have a hodgepodge. It is certainly true. Now he says, what then? Right on the top of the tree is where the fruit ripens first. Why? Because that's where the sun hits it. Okay, right on the top, <clears throat> right in the top of the tree. So it's the top of the tree <clears throat> where the evening light begins to shine. Now listen, Noah had three rooms in his ark. One room was for the creeping things. The second room was for fowls. And on the top room was... The there was light. That's where the light was. The light that shined first. It never came on the first floor, never came on the second floor, but on the top floor. See, at the end of the church, and the top is the top, very top. That's the end of the building. The tree doesn't bear its fruit <coughs> first. That's Luther in the bottom. Or the second, that's Wesley. Like that, it's all pruned off in organization. Wesley himself knew what was going to happen to the, to the Methodists. He said, he said I, I do not fear for one minute the name the Methodist will cease from this earth, but I fear lest the Spirit of God like a dove fly away. Right. Wesley himself knew it. These men look for the pillar of fire. Don't you worry. They look for the pillar of fire. The first <clears throat> tree didn't. The second tree didn't. All pruned off an organization. But it's in the top part. Where I will restore, saith the Lord, I'll send forth the evening light, and it'll bring back the word, making it manifest. I will restore all that I promised. All that I promised, the same Holy Spirit will bring and bear the same signs. I have an Easter, a resurrection for the bride, the same that I, as I had for the bridegroom. Let's go to 1 John. <clears throat> Verse, first verse, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew not him. Now look at right there. <clears throat> There's no recognition in you being an absolute true child of God. See, well, I can tell by that man's love. I can tell by his acts. I can tell by his spirit. You can't do it. And you are lying to yourself because Jesus had all of that. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He fed the multitude. And, and they said, we're going to kill you. And he said, what for? What evil have I done? Oh, ho, ho, nothing evil, dear boy. It's what you said. That's right. Amen. You believe that? You can't, you can't be sitting here this morning in your right mind and not know I'm telling you the truth. He killed him for what he said. So let's be honest. How can you tell? How does this same man John tell you that you're a son of God or not? He tells you if you say the same thing as he does, you're a God. And if you don't, you're not a God. Didn't say one thing how you acted. 
Paul the Apostle said, let love be without dissimulation. You can take every one of the nine fruits of the Spirit and every one of the nine gifts, so they're completely genuine, given by God. They can be in a phony just like Judas, who went out and healed the sick and raised the dead because he was one of the twelve that did it. Come on. It's in the Bible. And he was an actual devil. You're, you're, you're a diabolist, Jesus said. He did it. And you can take all of the nine fruits and you can be a hypocrite with them because Paul said, and you know the big fruit is love and everything they tell you, every, every ordained preacher, every organized preacher, especially every full gospel, every fundamental will tell you the word love contains all of those other eight gifts. And Paul said, let love be without hypocrisy. Amen. You have a hypocritical love. Yeah, same as a man seduces a woman, destroys your life. Let's keep reading. The world knoweth us not. They didn't know Jesus, not going to know you. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear. It says, and never come into existence what we shall be. But listen, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, <clears throat> for we shall see him as he is. How many people read that right? I'll tell you how they read it. They say, bless God, there's going to be a rapture. I'm going to, I'm going to be changed just like him, and I'm going to be caught up to see him. My Bible doesn't say that. My Bible says you've got to see him. Then you get your change. I've read my Bible. I've got 32 translations in my office strung around the house, 32 or better, unless I threw some away. I check all these verses out to see what all 32 people say, or maybe dozens more. They never say one thing different that I've caught. It's all the same story amongst the fundamental. Bless God, I'm going to be changed and I'll call it to see him. My Bible says you are going to see him here first before you ever get your change. Now, how are you going to see him? Amen. That's the point. Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. What was it? It wasn't his figure. No, it wasn't his figure. It was the works. And the works always lead in a prophet to vindication so the people know his word is from God. Will it come again in this hour? I believe with all my heart it's already come. Amen. I'm not trying to convince you. I was accused years ago by a very nice man. He and I didn't agree. He said, what troubled you, Bailey? You made an overkill. I never make an overkill. I can sit here hour after hour and hit scripture after scripture, send these tapes around the world, tape after tape, and they'll still come back and say, Lee Vale is preaching two gods, though I read exactly what I read here this morning. I've made statements and cleared myself from one end to the other, and hear a woman leave the church and phone her pastor and say, why did Brother Vale say so and so? He said, my sister, he didn't. What were you listening to? I'm not an overkill this morning with emphasis or anything else. I'm just trying to get you to understand what's in my heart, what I believe to be the truth by vindication. And, I'm, and if I am right, then I'm free from the blood of all men. Amen. I can meet any of you at the white throne or in hell, any place else. I'm free. If I'm right. Now, if I taught you wrong, I'm wrong and you're wrong. I got answer to God. I don't have to answer God for all your sins and all, mind you. I'm going to answer to God for leading you. Now, frankly, I don't lead anybody. I trust not. I, tr I trust the word of God leads us all. <clears throat> See? What then? Right in the top of the tree is where the fruit ripens first. That's right. Right in the top of the tree. It's at the top of the tree here we see the light. Now, listen. What is ripe fruit? At the top of the tree. At the end of time, there's a ripened fruit. Now, what is the ripened fruit? What did Adam want? What was his? immortality. When God was there in the form of the Holy Spirit, which he is anyway, giving him his word, the Holy Spirit leading him in the animals, God in control through a man. And the woman came by and enticed him, he went away. And Adam could not get to the tree. So what are we looking at? We are looking at the fact that the ripened fruit that should have been there, the interruption now, 6,000 years later, there is that manifestation where people stand in the presence of God himself, the Holy Ghost and the pillar of fire, completely manifested, proving it is God. It's time for a resurrection. It's time to go to the tree of life. It's time for immortality. For the evening light has come. Certainly, 
It was morning light over there in the east, but in the west. And the Bible tells you that. It's the light that traveled. It's the light that is here. The evening light came. The same light that shone in the morning, the same signs, the same light will produce the same fruit as it had there if it is shining in the same tree. Bride tree. Amen. Proves his word is now fulfilled. I will restore, saith the Lord. The light shone for the bride, not the prophet. William Branham did not have a sign for himself. He did not have a gift for himself. And let me tell you, the same word that came to William Branham, he had to live by the same word he gave to, gave to us. The same as that manna that Moses prayed for, for Israel. And God sent down, Moses ate the same man of the people ate. And I want to tell you something. The manna was not a crude, tasteless dish to Moses and to Caleb and to Joshua and those predestinated true men of God. It tasted rich, sweet, marvelous substance. They say it was like coriander. I can't stand coriander. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what this word tastes like. I want it because I know it is good for me it is right for me, and one day I will love it. And I do love it with all of my heart. I'm looking at it today. It was not for the prophet. This light fell on the bride, and it took a prophet, as Brother Branham said, to do it. Now, remember, Brother Branham does not take any pleasure to himself. He doesn't take any authority. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. Our Elijah today is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, not a man, God, but it comes by a prophet. And you show me any word, brother, sister, that does not come by a prophet. Now, let's look at these things. John was not a prophet, no dice. He was a scribe, he wrote. He wrote even the book of Revelation strictly from visions, again as a scribe. Paul was the prophet. Come on, Peter was. Peter could tell you things absolutely he knew from the word, but Christ said, word being fulfilled, but Peter, Although agreeing and understanding with Paul, he was not the one to whom the revelation came. Amen. Now let's go back. Can we get restored the right Jesus, the right word, the right spirit? You tell me. So, Brother Bale, it's logical. It's easy to see. It would take a man like Paul. That's exactly right. I believe we've seen it. I believe in our hour and our day this has come to pass. Well, the Lord bless you. My time always runs out, and I guess that's too good because... We all get tired. <clears throat> we need refreshing. Sometimes we hear too much. Hard to assimilate. I myself will admit to you without any wink of an eye that sometimes I have to pinch myself to remember many of the things that I get from the word here, go back and forth with what Brother Branham taught us to the Bible. And I'll be even, even go further that you may be really surprised. I have said things that I absolutely forgot and somebody reminded me but you're no different. You're no different. So if you forget something, we got a faithful God who brings those things to our remembrance, what we have need of. He supplies our need. Our life and breath are in him. Everything's in him. And I believe, brother, sister, that we are at the end time. Israel's in the homeland. Sign of the resurrection. Something has got to happen to get this bride out of here. And I believe with all my heart there is a bride. And I say with Brother Branham, the truth, and I say more truthfully, I believe, as the days go by, when he said, if we're not bride, there's a bride out there somewhere, and by the grace of God, I won't stand in her way. In other words, I won't do one thing. It'll take away from her what she believes she's got or she has got. I'll just stand back and watch, but I won't lay a finger on it. I believe what I'm preaching this morning from Brother Branham's message. I believe that God did plant that tree. I believe we are God's husbandry. I believe we're God's edifice. And as that edifice got to go right to the top where the capstone fits on, I believe it's right there, just like the pyramid, capstone to fit on. I have no doubt about that in my heart and mind. We're there. The same with the tree. I believe the evening light has come. I believe the fruit is ripe. I believe God is here in the form of the Holy Spirit, not as the baptizer now, though he is the baptizer, but he himself the baptizer, heading his own church, his voice will soon bring the dead out of the ground. We'll be changed, the Bible says. I believe there's going to be a bride. Get out of here. I hope by the grace of God I'm one. I cannot boast that I am. All I can do is believe. And that's all you can do. 
You say, I've seen what your actions, Brother Bill. That doesn't mean one thing. Take me back to the Word. Where am I off the Word? I can take David right back to the Word. Why did you even look at that woman? The minute you saw her naked, why didn't you take, take, take your eyeballs off of her and go to your room? He sinned right there. He covered another man's wife. He sinned right there. But I'm going to tell you, show me where David was off the Word. I can show you conduct. Show me Word. Let me say again what I said at the funeral, and I mean it because this could be a funeral too today. No man ever lived the Word outside of Jesus Christ, and no man ever will. But we can believe it. Amen. Let's rise and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the grace which has been given unto us. And we believe, Lord, that this is a manifestation of your love. And if we believe this word in your heart, then we believe also that the manifestation of love of God in our hearts, shed abroad there by the Holy Ghost, which, Lord, would tend, first of all, to glorify you in our members, knowing your grace and your glory and the honor you bestowed upon us, marvelous in this hour, and then turning to those, Lord, round about us, that we might share with them the glories of the mysteries which we have in this word been revealed to us, which we don't call mysteries as though we know them in a way that nobody else knows them to some self-aggrandizement, but the things, Lord, which are veiled and hidden, open to us, share them with others, and bring them as much as we can toward the understanding and the knowledge in this hour, not hoping to convert anybody, no way, not hoping to make anybody one of us, only hoping, Lord, that we are really telling the unadulterated truth and the Holy Spirit can work by it and do something for them, indeed, if something can be done. So, Lord, we stand here this morning, and, and we admit, Father, that it's just like a person, just like Brother Branham described Adam there. He could have stood there in flesh with his toes into the ground like roots of a tree, and then God breathed into the breath of life. And the man, not just stood any longer, began to pulsate and move a glorious creature of God. So breathe on us today, Lord. That's what we're asking by the Holy Spirit. Breathe on us, Lord, that we may and, and understand more of the light and that which has come in this hour. And we pray, Lord, you heal the sick amongst us. People are still sick, little children particularly. We ask you, Lord, that you heal the people here and help them. And whatever they have need of, we know that those needs are met. Father, it's wonderful to testify how that you do so wonderful things for us. You help us. You keep us in all these ways. And we're grateful for it, Lord. But above all, we're grateful for the grace given to us that whereby we believe we can be in. And certainly, Lord, we do believe with all of our hearts, as much as we can believe, that we're part of those ones that are going into the rapture. May grace and peace be multiplied to every single person here, not one person leave an unbeliever. In you, Lord, unbelieving in the truth of, of the great God who is reigning and ruling in this universe and one day will take over and make his own. And may there not be one of us missing in the holy city or outside to bring our glory in. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you.